Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Dolan with Manatee Educational Television. You all likely know what a phenomenal partner METV is to so many organizations in our community and what a treasure they are. And their expertise was just on display. So good afternoon. My name is Jackie Dazelski with the Manatee Chamber of Commerce. And we're thrilled that you've joined us today for our monthly headliners lunch, uh, today featuring Carlos Bucaris uh, with Port Manatee. And I know that you're eager to hear from Carlos. We've got a, the phenomenal Port team here as well to hear about what an economic driver uh, a deep water seaport is for a region and how much potential and opportunity there is with Port Manatee. Um, welcome also to Lakewood Ranch Golf and Country Club and hats off to the team here. They're always such a pleasure to, to work with and I know we'll be enjoying, enjoying their culinary masterpiece here in just a few minutes after some opening remarks. Um, if you would please silence your cell phones, we would certainly appreciate uh, that or um, it, put them away. Um, and then I'd also uh, ask that you please take a moment to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. You may be seated. We have a number of elected officials that have joined us today for our headliners lunch, and I would love to um, give them some shout out here. We've got uh, several members of the Manatee County Commission, which many of you here at the Port Manatee Headliners Lunch know also serve as the Port Authority Board. And so we've got Reggie Bellamy, Commissioner Reggie Bellamy, also chair of the Port Authority. <laughs> Commissioner Kevin Van Austin Bridge. Commissioner George Cruz, <laughs> Commissioner Carol Whitmore, and not elected, but County Administrator Dr. Scott Hopes, thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, we certainly appreciate your commitment and leadership uh, as we're talking about the port today, commissioners, knowing that's an additional responsibility that many voters don't realize falls on your plate once you're elected uh, to the Manatee County Commission. I'd also like to take a moment to recognize our sponsors for our monthly Headliners Luncheon Series that allows us to bring these types of speakers and topics to the Chamber's membership. They are the Mosaic Company, the Realtors Association of Sarasota and Manatee, and I know we've got Max Brandau with us, so thank you so much uh, for that support. And then we also recognize our platinum members of the Manatee Chamber, and these are a group of companies that make an additional significant investment in the mission and the programming of the Chamber, and I know we've got many of them with us, representatives from these companies here with us today. Just hold your applause until the end. Um, not up on the banner, but up on the screen, we have a new investor uh, within our chairman's circle at the platinum level, and that is Brown and Sons Funeral Home and Crematorium. So thank you so much uh, to Mayor Gene Brown and his family uh, and Brown and Sons for making the investment in the Chamber's mission. Carr, Riggs and Ingram, Manatee County Government, Manatee Memorial Hospital, MCR Health and All Care Options, The Mosaic Company, NDC Construction, The Pittsburgh Pirates and Bradenton Marauders, Raymond James Wealth Management, Bruce Body the Sarasota Bradenton International Airport, and South State Bank. So thank you so much. If you could give those investors a round of applause, I would appreciate it. With that, I'm going to allow the team here at Lakewood Ranch Golf and Country Club to serve lunch, and we'll be back up in just a few minutes to continue with our program. Enjoy your lunch. 
again, thank you to the staff here at Lakewood Ranch Golf and Country Club um, for their uh, great service for us. So I now have the privilege of introducing you to Carlos Bucaris. I know many of you in the room know Carlos or have worked with his team at the port over the years, but I will share um, some facts that you may not know about our esteemed port executive director. He has more than three decades of experience uh, with deep water sea ports um, and is globally renowned uh, for his visionary achievements in all facets of seaport business and development. Hats off to his team for that um, phenomenal opening sentence. Um, but it has been an absolute pleasure to work with Carlos since he came to Manatee County. He took the helm in January of 2012 and has collaborated with public and private sector partners in leading Port Manatee through a period of unprecedented growth and accomplishment. The success has persisted throughout the past challenging year and a half, and Port Manatee just had another record-breaking year as it continues to generate more than 3.9 billion, that's a billion with a B, in annual economic impact for our region while prov providing more than 27,000 direct and indirect jobs. Port Manatee's growth in 2020 brought increased cargo volumes, more employees, and even bus service. We are so lucky to have Carlos with us today to share more about the port. I'll tell you a couple of stories of uh, our partnership with the Manatee Chamber and Port Manatee over the years uh, is Carlos and his team's creativity and perseverance um, have brought, gosh, dozens of foreign trade delegations to Manatee County to learn more about our port and the opportunities that they have uh, to open up new markets and new partnerships with local businesses. Uh, the Chamber has played a very small role as part of the welcoming party for those international trade delegations that visit our region. We've hosted lunches and breakfasts and even a trade show at the Manatee Chamber's offices uh, to show these companies how important public-private partnership, how important a strong working relationship between local businesses and local government can be for the success of businesses particularly businesses that are in transition or in growth periods. So I am looking forward to us having more opportunities like that uh, in the future. And without further ado, I introduce Carlos Bucaris, Executive Director of Port Manatee. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jackie. It's great to be here again. You know, it's always a pleasure to be able to promote the ports, businesses, and opportunities, and the growth of the port has realized over the last few years. You know, the port continues to be a major economic engine without any tax or ad valorem support. That's why we like it. In comparison, if you live in Hillsborough, you pay about $25 a year to take to the port of Tampa about uh, $12 million of taxpayer funded, or let's say residential funded support. So we do it the old-fashioned way. We kind of earn our business. We earn our money. I want to thank my board, though, for coming. They're very busy, you know, and I only need them once a month, but uh, they have to show up to the Port Authority meeting. And uh, it's a great board of directors as opposed to a board of county commissioners. At the port, they're not really commissioners. They're business people. And they're looking to grow the businesses without any, again, taxpayer expense at the county and throughout southwest Florida. They're truly a board of directors voting on and choosing the strategy of the port as well as the major investments of the port. And as such, they do it like business people without regard to any other issue but the well-being of the, let's say, the businesses that will be impacted as well as the impact to all, essentially all of Florida. Uh, I also want to, you know, again, thank my team. Uh, without them, you know, I wouldn't be here. Without them, we couldn't do this through covid They've been in the port just about every day. Uh, we have fortunate to have separate offices where we could uh, prudently and cautiously separate, but the port never closed for 10 minutes during 2020 and even into 21, because you and the businesses and the counties around us need the port for one thing, for example, is fuel. All of the fuel that's coming out out of the port is going to fill your gas stations. If we were interrupting the port's business, imagine, you know, you'd be making some calls, not to me, but to the governor, complaining about the port. 
and what's happening there. So we remain open 24-7. We're open more than Publix. Uh, truly 24-7. Deliveries from the port are 24-7, 365. So, you know, a lot to do there. I also want to thank Logistech, one of my largest customers, and Andre Dubois was here. Uh, a Canadian-based company from Montreal, but has huge investments in Florida. Huge. Multi-million dollar investments. Because, again, they believe in the opportunities here at the port and in Florida. So they're really continuing, in fact, have even raised their stakes in terms of investment recently at the port. We're thankful uh, for that. Um, again, so let's go briefly into the presentation, and then we'll go through a, a Q&A. The board, you already know who they are, so I'll skip that one. But again, they act as a board of directors, business directors, as opposed to county commissioners when they are at the port. A lot of ports in Florida, 15 of us. Uh, so we need to keep an eye on all of them because they're likely to take our business if we turn the other way, even though we're not supposed to. It happens quite often. I'll tell you a few stories about that in a minute. So this is a actual picture of the Port of Tampa. The Port of Tampa distributes these at every business meeting they have, showing where their port is and where we are. And so I dare you to find us on the map. So they literally redrew the coastline. They spend extra money to redraw the coastline so any customer looking at their port wouldn't we be aware that we are there. On our map, of course, we show the Port of Tampa. But nonetheless, I've been trying to make them change the coastline, but they refuse. So we'll leave it as it is for now. Right there is where it's supposed to be. <laughs> okay? So they, you know, they, uh, you can see there's no indentation, there's nothing. So we are the closest port to the open sea. That's why they're so concerned about us. But I feel that ports should cooperate with each other. We're under the Florida port system. And as such, there's more than enough cargo to go around all the ports and then some. We probably wished we had more ports to be able to bring in more cargo. Because as you know, everything we buy, in some cases, mostly originates overseas. So the opportunities for the ports to bring in cargo is immense. And, and we need to keep that in mind, uh, such as happened in, West, in, in East Florida, Southwest, Southeast Florida where Everglades and Miami are full, you know, and now they need other ports north of them, like Port of uh, Canaveral, to be able to uh, handle the uh, demand. So again, we earn our business, we earn our money. We are an at-risk business. At any given point, we could lose a major customer, not one container at a time, we could lose thousands or millions of dollars. So we're very proactive in developing business, locally, nationally, and internationally. Okay. We have a large number of experts at the port that can do that, and so we actively seek business every day, either to increase the business of the port or in anticipation of having to replace a business that might leave. Again, our, we have an ideal position at the entrance of Tampa Bay because to sail north is at least three additional hours of sailing time and three additional hours of polluting the bay. So, you know, we tell them, we just move the port of Tampa down here um, and we're done. So looking at what we do, we have a 3.9 in annual impact, 27,000 jobs, again, no ad valorem, and in local taxes, we pay about $4 million. Our businesses pay about $4 million to the county coffers. So not only does it not take away, but it adds, and that's the way it should be. And so we're looking to increase that every day. Some of our business partners and members, uh, there's a variety from the pineapple you have at your uh, table from Del Monte, one of our largest customers, to the cement that you might be using at your home, to other uh, commodities that you might bring, such as orange juice, as an example. All the OJ you're drinking comes from the port, comes through the port, I should say. 
And of course, we have our federal partners. We have every agency in the US, in the federal system, represented at the port. So that means that we're able to clear customs. We're able to do the immigration issues. We're there to do the USDA issues and move it quickly because from the time that that, let's say that pineapple is cut to the time it gets on the shelf, it's losing time and it's losing value. So the speed to shelf is critical for us. Also, of course, we prepare to handle a large range of businesses. We have not turned down any business at the port because we couldn't handle it or it was too big or not worth it. We handle every bit of business and that's why we've been able to grow so significantly over the last few years. Air products, major employer now, Del Monte also, the lumber, and now yachts too. As you see, almost 400 million gallons of fuel filling every gas station between uh, University College Avenue in Hillsborough all the way down to essentially Collier County. Significant footprint with gas. A billion bananas. 48 million pineapples, 35 million avocados, and 57 million gallons of orange juice. Those are just some of the commodities we handle, the larger ones, the ones that are the you know, very significant numbers that you wouldn't realize we're doing. Again, fuel hub and the footprint, as you can see, all the way down to Collier and sometimes into Broward or Miami-Dade or even Palm Beach. If there's a, hurric a hurricane coming, uh, the Coast Guard will close the ports on the east coast of Florida. When they close the ports, the fuel hubs are shut down. If the hubs are shut down, there's a big problem on the east coast. So the process is that then our uh, tank farm will fuel those uh, gas stations in Broward County or Miami or Palm Beach from west to east, where the ports will remain open. Of course, it works the other way too. So, you know, but uh, fortunately, uh, in this situation, we're able to supply that, but we were not doing that about you know, eight years ago. Uh, we consider ourselves a gateway to international trade, which we are, and we also encourage the small business owner that's interested in exploring international business opportunities to come to the port. So, we created an international trade hub and a foreign trade zone, and the opportunities with manufacturing, and air uh, uh, allied new technologies. And so we're growing the port, we're growing the port significantly. This was a need that we identified and cooperated with the county, because some of the workers at the port did not have transportation. So in another effort to collaborate with the county and the Port Authority and the county commissioners, the county worked on a program with us to be able to have people without a car to be able to get to the port to work. And these salaries are good salaries, good paying salaries are not service type jobs. Uh, they pay well and as such, you know, the difficulty is that we are in the north side of the county. It's not easy to get to us. Again, our charter, our, our mission is to be a trade related, a hub for trade related activity. When I came to the port, we had no hub of trade related activity, as Jackie was mentioning before. So we created one. Essentially, it's a World Trade Center where someone who doesn't need to charter a boat or doesn't want to bring in a container can come and get the support to expand their growth or to expand their business into uh, any internationally. So we have companies also coming in, which we want to hire local people. So the hub acts just like it says, a hub for trade. It's at the port. I welcome any of you here to come and visit anytime you want, and we'll show you what they do in case you have an opportunity to either refer it or use it yourself. These are some of the companies from overseas we've had recently. So growth, growth, growth. Uh, and the reason for this is that if we let these companies looking to expand in Florida to their own, let's say, uh, resources, they would stay in Miami-Dade, or they would stay in Palm Beach, or they would stay in Broward, 
Once they land at the airport, the further you are away from Miami International, the harder it is for these companies to find their way here. So we made it, like Jackie said, we made a program, we created a program to bring in international trade commissioners. So these are the chief commercial officers for each country overseas. So if someone from, let's say, Chile wants to come into Florida, they'll call their Commerce Department in Chile, who will call the Commerce Department their office here in, their, in Miami, and Miami will find them something. So we brought the Miami Trade Officer here from Chile, and we showed them what he could do. Now, in his portfolio, in addition to having Miami and Palm Beach and Broward, he has Manatee County, Sarasota County, even Hillsborough County. So we are, in a sense, distributing that opportunity so they just don't stay down there <clears throat> and miss the opportunities that could be here, both for them and for the residents here. <clears throat> Growth has continued, as you could see a little dip in 2020. Mostly related to the fact that you couldn't drive. You can't drive, I can't give you the gas. So as such, that dip was reflective of the inability or the people staying home as opposed to any other business disruption. The ships came in nonstop. Our containers continue to surge. We are at a level, for example, where our nearest uh, you know, container port, Port of Tampa, was handling less than we are today just two years ago, or three years ago. And so you know, the, the capability as a container port has really been confirmed. And so the things you buy come in containers for the most part. And probably 98% of everything that moves is moving in containers. The rest is moving by air cargo. So the ability to handle containers was a great opportunity. And we're expanding the capacity of the container yard to be able to even double that in the coming years. So we're making lots of investments, self-funded again, internally generated monies. As you can see, there's a long list of uh, security projects of uh, gate expansions, birth rehabilitations, railroad, et cetera. That's a, in the uh, background there on the, on the bottom is the container yard, the expansion. And right there at the top or in the middle there is a uh, orange juice ship, direct in bulk coming from Brazil. They dock, they discharge, they go to Tropicana or other fruit, let's say uh, juice uh, processors in Florida and it goes right to the supermarket. Security and gate expansion are key. I gotta be able to get those trucks in and those trucks out quickly and efficiently. We pride ourselves in our speed to which we can get trucks in and out. Sometimes other ports, for example, Port of Miami, a trucker, and they're even trying to protest um, because it could take four hours to get into the port. If it takes four minutes here, we're, we're alarmed. We have a problem. Security, security, security. We're, one, we're a very secure port. We do everything by the book. And we have customs and other federal agencies to make sure that we do. But we reinvest in our security system all the time. In fact, our port security department trains other ports, trains other agencies, including the FBI, in port security. So if we're training the FBI, we know we've got to be doing something right in our security because we're the only ones, the only public port in the country who trains the FBI and other federal agencies. So, great security department. Uh, we're looking to expand the port, both inland as well as, let's say, towards the water, because we need more docking space to park all those ships, to put all those ships there. Berth space to us is like runway length to an airport. You just cannot have, you know, the big, big planes if you only have a 4,000 foot runway. You need an eight, nine, 10,000 foot runway, and we're doing that, our equivalent, which is birth expansion. So again, lots of investments in our facilities, both public and private. We have an, what they call a um, you know, Stella Maris, or the star of the sea, or the anchor house, or the, you know, the, the home of the sailor. And Anchor House at the port has even gone in cooperation with the health department to vaccinate seamen right on board the ship or at their facility. 
So we're even doing our part internationally to be able to control the pandemic as quickly as possible. Quite a few highlights, as you can tell. I'll let you just briefly go through them. I won't bother you with all the details. But we're looking really to grow. Grow, grow, expand, and grow some more. And you're gonna see in a second how that's happening. So, World Direct Shipping, which came to the port about five years ago, was a very modest company that started with one ship, then they bought two ships, then they bought three ships, and probably 80,000 containers. And then they went across the street on private property and bought over 400 acres of land for port use, for their use. So between air products, I like new technologies, and over 400 acres of transportation space. This is an affirmation of the impact and the need for these companies to be able to grow at the port. So now North County, which had always been you know, kind of difficult to, to assess for business purposes, has a reaffirmation from a private developer, World Direct Shipping, purchased 400 acres, and all these guys do, they are not into warehouse distribution centers, they're into their own business. They are one of the largest fruit importers in the country, and they're in DeKalb, Georgia. Now, of course, their office is here, and World Direct Shipping has now grown to be the 22nd largest container importer in the U.S. from zero, and they're headquartered in Palmetto. It's the only one in the world of that grade. I expect they'll go down to number 20 pretty quickly, making the top 20 largest importers of containers in the US. So that's quite a significant number coming from a small company really where they wanted to handle their products and they saw the opportunity to grow getting their own ships and then buying additional acreage to expand. Take a look at a quick uh, video and then uh, we'll do some Q&A. Port Manatee is a leading economic engine and a diverse global gateway for Southwest Florida. The following projects for fiscal year 2021 to 2022 improve the port's infrastructure, increasing its attractiveness to new and existing customers while also supporting jobs, trade, and commerce. Dry bulk operations have experienced significant growth. The combined berth length of berths 4 and 5 is only 1,200 feet, making it challenging to support operations on both berths simultaneously. Extending berth 4 by 600 feet will create space for the operation of two vessels at the same time. The project is currently in design and permitting. The cost of phase 1 is $11 million with 75% funded by FDOT. After the complete reconstruction of berth 9, berth rehabilitation primarily focused on wharf and wall repairs at berth 6 and secondarily at berth 7 and 8 is underway and expected to be completed by October 2022. The cost of this is $3.5 million with 75% funded by FDOT. Considerable increases in container volumes and ongoing transition from break bulk to containers have resulted in the full capacity of the existing 10-acre intermodal container yard. The port initially planned to expand the container yard by 8 acres, which no longer meets the current demand. Extra funding from FDOT allows for additional expansion as Port Manatee expects to exceed 100,000 TEUs this fiscal year. The cost of this is $13.1 million with 50% funded by FDOT. In 2002, the port installed approximately 3.3 miles of fence line around its perimeter. Significant portions of the fence have corroded and now require complete replacement. The first phase of this project includes replacing approximately one and a quarter miles of fence along the port's northern perimeter. As part of this project, the port will also replace its aging access control gate arms. The cost of this is $500,000 with 75% funded by Homeland Security. The port's railroads provide direct access to the national rail system and play an important role in moving cargo. The railroad track rebuild consists of new switches, cross ties, tie plates, and replacement with heavier rail. The cost of this is $1.4 million with 67% funded by Federal Railroad Administration, 22% by FDOT, and 11% by the port. The Warehouse 6 renovation project will improve existing warehouse space to support cargo flow through the port. Renovations include complete warehouse, including the interior and exterior of the building, to enhance its structural integrity. 
These much needed improvements will provide longtime tenant Del Monte Fresh Produce with a safe and efficient warehouse and office for many years to come. The cost of this is $4.25 million, funded by FDOT, The Port, and Del Monte Fresh Produce. Port Manatee's gate activity has tripled to the current annual pace of 750,000 transactions. This project will expand the South Security Gate facility into a full-service complex with four configurable lanes and capabilities for handling the full spectrum of registered, temporary, and visitor transactions. The cost of this is $1 million, with 75% funded by Homeland Security. This project will encompass a comprehensive update of port-wide security systems, including modernizing computer software and integrating video and access control technologies into a common operating platform. This will cost $750,000 with 75% funded by Homeland Security. Thank you very much. Um, I've been asked I've been, if there's any questions. Oh, let me turn this back on. Any questions, you have to go up to the mic so it can be recorded because we have uh, Manatee County TV here. So while we're waiting for someone to think of a good question, uh, I'll tell you a funny story, which is true. That's what's interesting, talking about competing ports. At, see those pineapples at your table? It was a real interesting story. So. We handle 48 million pineapples at the port, more than you know, twice the amount of people, for three times the amount of people that live in Florida. So it's going really nationally. So uh, our former chief commercial officer, Matty Apici, saw there was a conference at the Port of Tampa with the, in cooperation with the International Trade Pineapple Association. I said, great. He said, go sign up. So he signs up, sends in this payment, his registration, it's in. Then he gets an email a day before uninviting him to the pineapple conference. <laughs> the Port of Tampa didn't want him there. I said, oh, this is too good to be true. I said, Matty, go anyway. Show up at the door. Make a long story short, he was the first executive escorted out by security <laughs> from the pineapple conference. <laughs> so <laughs> you believe it. That pineapple has a lot of meaning. It's really, as you know, the symbol Baptist general of, you know, of, of welcome. So he was kicked out of the welcome conference for the pineapple. So, you know, and, and, and they're still handling very few pineapples, if any, now. So it didn't help them much. But I thought I'd say that just, you know, just to, just to brief you on what's going on. Thank you, it's a very good question because we grow business exponentially. Like when air products came, they didn't need one welder a year. They needed 200 welders now. And Jackie and Manatee County government and the port and the Board of Education where Dr. Hopes you know, was there I believe then took a cooperative effort to train people to do that. So we need all skills. We never know who's gonna walk in through the door that will need 200 welders or chemists or any other profession like now. Although we do have some, uh, some warning, the ability that the team with county and school board and the port uh, have come together always in being able to make sure we have those skills that are trained. But every trade is necessary, even professionals and economists, marketing people, because these companies that come to the hub are hiring marketing people, they're hiring financial people, they're hiring accountants, they're hiring lawyers, so everything is necessary. Hi, um, I had a question actually for, um, you mentioned I think 396 uh, million gallons of gas that come through. Um, do you have any plans to offset that when uh, more like vehicles come out in the future and maybe there's less gas consumption? Well, it isn't up to us because these gas stations you know, are driven by the need for the consumer. So we leave that to the car companies, we leave that to the oil companies. Obviously there's a trend towards electric vehicles more and more and more. But um, from a practical perspective, we don't have an ability to influence that. 
but you as a consumer do. So when you start buying, you know, and a few of our employees own electric vehicles at the port already. And so that's going to happen. So yeah, that's going to diminish, I think, over the next you know, 10, 15 years uh, as companies try to develop more electric vehicles. And we'll have to replace that fossil fuel business with other businesses, maybe a lot of charging stations, right? A manufacturing facility for charging stations across the street in order to be able to keep up with demand. Good afternoon. Kim Bailey with Feeding Empty Little Tummies. Um, first, I wanted to thank you because I think a lot of people forget how much Port uh, Manatee gives back to the community. And we, our charity, has been a recipient of the Propeller Club. So we're so grateful not only for the jobs that you've provided in our community, but also how you've given back uh, to Manatee County and the surrounding areas. So as one charity in the community, I'm very grateful for what you do for our community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We have a lot of the Propeller Club members right here at our table because the port does support the Propeller Club extensively. And even at Virginia, our director of communications is also the vice president, right? Uh, or vice chairman for the Propeller Club. Yes, Commissioner. So, can you explain the difference between uh, what we are and other ports are? We're a landlord port versus the others? Absolutely. So there's various flavors of ports. And the old expression says, if you've seen one port, you've seen one port. In Florida, there are multiple systems of ports, government and operating and landlord. So we are, well, I would say we used to be, when I first came to the port in 2012, much more of a landlord port. A landlord port is a port essentially who, uh, who negotiates long-term leases with users, such as, for example, Logistech for land. And then they commit to a certain amount of money on that land, that's how you get your money. Operating ports, they essentially work those containers themselves. And so while we're not working the containers ourselves, because the outer fence of the port is essentially our yard, our container area, we, through our operations department, manage where the containers go in order to maximize the capability to do that. So we transitioned from landlord only to landlord and operating quite a bit. So. Uh, that's has happened also. And the others essentially are mostly landlord. Port of Miami, Everglades, um, Palm Beach. Um, in containers, Tampa is really a landlord port. They have one container company handling the containers. Uh, and so that's basically now what, you know, what we're doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We appreciate your attention. And Carlos, to you and your team, again, thank you for making the commitment uh, to be engaged with our chamber in an event like today's headline. So thank you all for your attention. I have just a couple closing announcements for some things to be on your radar that your chamber is bringing to you here shortly. Um, first, I'd like to once again recognize the sponsors for our headliner series. And if anyone is interested in how your organization uh, could support this type of programming, we'd love to talk to you about sponsorships. But thank you so much to the Mosaic Company, as well as to the Sarasota Manatee um, Realtors Association. Thank you once again to Lakewood Ranch Golf and Country Club staff. Thank you to Manatee Educational Television to allow this programming to be available to an even larger audience once we wrap with our luncheon today. Um, two dates for you that I have coming up on September 10th, which is this Friday, I believe. The Chamber will be hosting a webinar uh, with Labor and, and Employment Attorney Ann Chapman, um, who will be speaking with the business community about what small businesses need to know about the evolving COVID policies and protocols for employers. And I'll tell you, I think we're already at more than 100 uh, registered for this. So um, understanding that small businesses um, are seeking information don't necessarily have an HR uh, you know, professional on their staff like larger companies um, have. We thought this was an opportunity for the Chamber to bring some very specific programming for small businesses. So if you know of any small businesses that are still navigating the ever-changing environment related to COVID policies, we would love to have them join us this Friday for that webinar. Then next Friday, on the 17th, we'll be hosting another webinar uh, featuring um, employees from Carr, Riggs, and Ingram who will be talking about the employee retention tax credit. 
What we believe, looking at data from across the country, again, particularly as it relates to small businesses, is that many small businesses are unaware of the opportunity that they have to claim the employee retention credit, which literally could be thousands of dollars of cash back to small businesses on uh, their, um, their employee uh, uh, tax bill. And so if you know of small businesses that may have been drowned in the PPP and the CARES Act grants um, and all of the other opportunities they've had to take advantage of uh, state, federal, and local support, the employee retention credit is one that's really important for small businesses not to miss. It could be up to $14,000 back to businesses um, per employee if they qualify. So let anyone you know uh, that might need this information know about that webinar that will take place next Friday. Um, and then one other date that I would love to have on your calendars is the date of our Small Business of the Year Awards. This is one of the highlights of our year every year at the Manatee Chamber as we recognize the significant importance that small all businesses have to our local economy. We'll be celebrating almost 100 nominees this year for the Manatee Small Business of the Year Awards, and that date is November 16th, and we will be at the Manatee Convention Center. Um, and so please let us know if you would like to join us for um, that uh, really important signature awards program that we do uh, each year to celebrate the importance um, of small businesses. Kim has told me we expect it to sell out, as it does every year, and I think this year, as much as any, we want to celebrate the successes and importance of businesses that have gone through so much in the past year and a half. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attendance and your attention, and we look forward to seeing you at the next opportunity we have to welcome you to a chamber event or program. Y'all have a great afternoon.